la
He says, walking in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. Even though we are fleshly beings in our humanity, our war is against the flesh. It's spiritual. I, I want you to get that tonight. For us as believers, our warfare is spiritual. I'm not concerned or worried about other human beings in the world and waging war against them when they don't have the authority really to do me any harm. The word of God says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It is the evil one who causes others in the flesh to come against you. So your war is not really against the individual. It's against the spiritual or principality that's operating within that being. So here it is. He wants us to understand we do not war according to the flesh. And then he says this. The weapons in verse 4 of our warfare are not common. What, they, what, what am I fighting with? If they're not carnal, as a human being, I got to have a weapon that I can use against powers and principalities. That means I got to have a prayer line. I got to have a voice that can speak to God in such a manner that God will respond in the affirmative to fight my spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. But if we are walking in the flesh, we don't have that ability. So we have to walk in what? The spirit. Right. And, and that's hard to do sometimes because some people won't allow you to be spiritual. They'll do everything they can to pull you out of the spirit. But as Christians, we have to understand that if we walk in the authority that God has given us, then the weapons of our warfare are not calm. There in verse 3, he said this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, flesh but for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. But what are they mighty for? He says, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Those are the areas, if you're with me tonight, those are the areas that we ought to be concerned with as believers walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Our warfare isn't against another human being. It's against powers and principalities. But he has given us the areas that we need to make sure that we're focusing on as we find ourselves doing spiritual warfare. He said this, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not common, but they are mighty in God. So what does he let us know? Paul is letting the Corinthian church know your power ain't in you. And that's good for somebody today in 2024. You may feel like the moment is bigger than you, that you're not, you don't have the strength to stand under the pressure, under the, under the oppression. But I came by to tell somebody tonight, your strength is, is, is not in you. You are made mighty in God because you are a child of God. And he says, why? Because this is to work for us, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. These are things that can materialize in the flesh. So we have to work spiritually to keep those things under control. Pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and then every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's strong right there, and that's good for 2024, because if you ever get on social media, there's a lot of stuff out there going against the kingdom of God and the principles of God. 
And if you are not careful, you will be drawn in. But he says this is spiritual warfare. So if we are doing spiritual warfare, then the word of God holds true because it says against every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If it's speaking against the knowledge of God, if it speaks against the existence of God, then our warfare is to come against it and dispel it. That's where we spend our time, and we have to spend our time in that fight. He says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What is he telling the church there? Watch how you think. Because your thoughts become reality if you linger with them long enough. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you allow your imagination to run rampant with you, your thoughts will take you to a place where you're going to find yourself becoming prey to the evil one. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Bringing every thought into captivity, not some of them. Because, see, we, we, we get wishy-washy. When we get in our sin, sometimes we like our sin and some things that we do, and, and we don't pay as much attention to the thing that we like. But if it's working against God, then we ought to be definitely paying attention to it. Right. But he says, bringing every thought into captivity. If it's running across your mind, you need to grab it. You need to take control of it and use obedience to be the weapon that you're going to fight with. I'm going to walk in the Word. Y'all not that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk in the Word. While, while the world is doing their thing and while people are trying to, to bring you out and get you to do what they're doing, walk in the Word. Okay. I'm going to be obedient to God's Word. I know it doesn't look good. I know it doesn't feel good to some folks. I know it's going to disturb some people. It's going to make them sick. They ain't going to want to see me coming, but I'm going to walk in the Word. <laughs> Because out of that obedience comes authority, and I get the victory in spiritual warfare. Amen. So we have to remember that our weapons of our warfare are not common, but they are there to cast down arguments, bring thoughts into captivity, and then it says that it brings every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So once you grab it, Take hold of it. Now you take it to the place where it obeys Christ. That's a powerful thing. Because when you are warring in the spirit, you got to ultimately get that thing you're warring with to surrender. Somebody just missed it, and I'm going to give it to you. You don't go to warfare for the fun of it. You go to warfare to get your enemy to surrender. We're bringing them captive and taking them captive in the obedience of Christ. Then he says this toward the end of that next verse. It says, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You have to be ready to punish disobedience. You can't let it slide. You can't let it get back. You got to deal with it. I wish I had some help tonight. It's okay. We got to deal with disobedience when it comes to the children of God and the people of God. When, when we find ourselves engaged in the flesh and that thing that we are warring against is spiritual, then not only do we want to take it captive, and bring it into obedience of Christ. But now we got to say. It's going to be some consequences. Mm -hmm. Behind your ass. Can I help somebody tonight? When you walk out of all with God. When you are walking in your flesh. And the things that you do. And allow to manifest. There comes a time. When some of those things. Are going to show up. And they're going to have some consequences. Your actions. Will have consequences. There's no way around it. So you got to understand, you got to help others understand 
that it's better to walk in obedience than deal with the consequences and the punishment of disobedience. But so often, we watch people walk out of order in the body of Christ. This book is written for the believers. God already knows the sin is out of order, but he's looking at us, and we are out of order. So we have to be our brothers, keepers. We have to check each other. We have to make sure you all right, I'm all right, you all right, I'm all right. Yeah, because we don't want people to fall prey to the wicked one. And his devices will cause you to walk in disobedience, but he doesn't suffer the consequences. He leaves you to suffer the consequences. I wish somebody could get that. Because mm -hmm. some people are walking in some stuff, they had no idea where it was going, but where it took them to, the enemy left them there. And now they're dealing with the consequences of their action. And then, how do you look at things according to the outward appearance? It says in verse 7, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? Are your spiritual eyes open? Or is it just your natural eyes that you're going through life looking through your natural lenses? Mm. How, how, how are you approaching the outward appearance? Just because it looks good doesn't mean it's good. Just because it has the appearance that it could be safe, it may not be safe. I wish somebody got that. It says, if anyone is convinced in himself that he is, is Christ, that means Christ's possession, let him again consider this in himself. That just as he is Christ, even so, we are Christ. So the Lord has ownership of us as his children. Don't get caught sleeping on an outward appearance. How, how do we check it? The Bible says it's by the Spirit. The Spirit recognizes the Spirit. The Spirit of the individual. It's not on the outside, it's on the inside. People can look church. They can look like they got it together. They can quote scripture. They know the hymns, they know the songs, they know all the options of worship. But there's something on, if their heart is not right, if their spirit is not right, your spirit will pick up on it. You have a spirit of discernment that will be developed in you in spiritual warfare that will help you to discern what's of the Lord and what's not of him. Do not be fooled by the outward appearance. We as believers, we got to go beyond the outward appearance. We have to see things as they are. Then he moves into verse 8. And it says, but even if I should boast. Notice that word, should. He's not boasting. But he said, even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority. In other words, I can take pride in what I got in God. And I can just really put it out there and just revel in it. But I'm not going to boast. But what he says, which the Lord gave us for a reason. So I can't boast in it because what he's given us, this authority to do spiritual warfare is for edification. Right. It's to edify us that we might glorify God in all that we do. So let's not get beside ourselves as I'm walking with the Lord that I'm doing this thing so great. Let's not get to the place where we think that it can't move and function without us because I got it going. I, I know what I'm doing. And, and, and you'll find yourself in a bad place. But Paul says to the Corinthian church, telling them, even as Pastor Paul, I ain't gonna boast. 
I heard it, I wanted to, but I'm not because I know better because I know the authority which was given to us by our Lord was for edification. What I walk in is to make you better. Mm -hmm. When you edify somebody, you make them better. Y'all, y'all, you get it. While we have been trying to work on self and, and, and elevate, God is saying, what about the folk you not tend to? All of us in ministry, whether we're sitting in the pews or the pulpit, if we are a member of the kingdom of God, we ought to be trying to edify someone to make them better, that they can glorify God in their existence and in their purpose. That's our authority. Mm -hmm. You ought to be better for being around me. You ought to be better for spending time with me. You ought to be better for my study. You ought to be better for my messages. I didn't come to entertain you. I came to edify you. I came to build you up. I came to make you better in the kingdom of God that you can glorify God in all that you do. I, I, I wish somebody could get that tonight. Church is not the place to come and play. It's the place where you come in the sanctuary broken, destroyed, feeling weak, torn down, but when you get that out, be an edifying word that builds you up from the floor. That's right. To be better yeah. to serve God. Yeah. If everything else is going wrong in my life, I ought to on Sunday morning, if I can just make it into the house of the Lord, something ought to be said that will edify me, that will build me up out of my situation, help me to walk better in my authority. Help me to do spiritual warfare that I might glorify God. He says, are you ashamed of what God has done and gives you there in verse 8? Yeah. Not for your destruction. He says, I shall not be ashamed. Are you there? Yeah. I shall not be ashamed. It didn't say again. Because too many of us who are believers, who are supposed to be walking in God's authority, we got our heads down. Mm. We hide in corners. We trap. We, we're at a place where we don't want folks to see us for who we are in the body of Christ. We don't want that attention. Mm -hmm. We're walking in this thing, but we're really ashamed of how we walk. Mm. We walk with others who are not saved so that we can feel good about ourselves. Y'all been talking back. So we can feel good about ourselves. We'll engage in activities with folks who are not saved so we can feel good about ourselves. Are we ashamed of who we are in Christ Jesus? Something ought to be different about us. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I shall not be ashamed. No matter what he's facing, no matter what he's going through, he realizes there's no shame in this thing. The Lord died for me. I wish I had some help. Mm -hmm. We just came through Resurrection Sunday. How can you be ashamed when you just celebrated the most powerful day in Christianity? Are we going to hide from the world and let the world go dark and dim and not let our light shine because we don't want confrontation? I came to take it on in the name of Jesus. We got to do some warfare if we're going to ever turn this thing around. We got to walk in our authority if we're going to ever turn it around. You're going to have to walk in the grocery store in your authority. You're going to have to walk on your job in your authority. You're going to have to walk in your neighborhood in your authority. You're going to have to walk in some of your relatives' house in your authority so they can get a glimpse of what Christ really looks like. Y'all Because so many of them are in the dark, and we sat back and we allowed them to push us to the corner, take control of the situation, make us feel guilty, make us feel bad for what we represent. But I stopped by the night as I closed the lesson. I agree with Paul. I shall not be ashamed. I shall not be ashamed. Be ashamed. 2024, y'all. Too much is at stake. Mm. We got to get it right. Mm. 
Let's not be ashamed of what God is doing with us. Let's give him the glory as he edifies us and builds us up, elevates us and makes us more for the kingdom of God. Let's not be ashamed. He loved us. He died for us. And there's nothing we can do about it. Amen. Just accept the glory. Walking. And then be his representation in the earth. I hope that blessed somebody tonight. Amen. I hope somebody caught that in this lesson. And if you need to go back and look at the passage, re-listen to the lesson, do so, share with a friend. But there's warfare, but yet we have authority. Through the scripture, Paul makes it very clear. But I want you to leave tonight. I want you to leave saying, I, I shall not be ashamed. I thank God for what he's doing for me. I thank God for what he's doing through me. And if it comes down, I thank God for what he's doing to me. Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you tonight. Amen. As we get ready to go, let's go before the Lord with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the lesson tonight. We thank you for the word. Warfare and authority that we possess are real. That Lord God, we thank you through the scriptures that you encouraged us. That Lord God, there are some areas that we need to focus on. We need to cast down arguments. Uh, we need to take thoughts into captivity. And then beyond that, we need every thought should be taken into captivity and brought into the obedience of Christ. And anything that goes against the knowledge of God, we need to speak out against it. We thank you for the lesson tonight. Now, Father God, give us traveling grace as we leave the sanctuary, this virtual platform. Lord, use us as instruments of your being in these dark days. Let something we say or do bless someone's life that they'll be edified. That we'll build them up where they're torn down, strengthen them where they'll be, give them courage before fear can ever set in. Continue to bless our sick and shut in, our homebound, those that are in hospitals and nursing homes. Lord God, watch over them in a mighty way. And Father God, you and I are incarcerated. Bless them in their situation tonight. Continue to give them a revelation of who you are. And then, Lord, when we reach our destination, allow us to find things decent and in order. We'll carefully give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for you alone are worthy. And this is your servant's prayer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name. Amen, amen, amen. I thank God for those that are in the sanctuary, for those who are viewing virtually. Have a great rest of the week. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday, and we're going to live the praise in this house unto the Lord. And remember this, God loves you, but the pastor loves you as well.